We've covered how the FN-1900 kicked off an entire market for 32 ACP pocket pistols. Let's see another unique design coming from Belgium that would be produced in Austria and eventually make its way into the trenches of the First World War. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Steyr Piper Model 1909 Tipping Barrel Pistol. Let's take a look in the light box. Our little 32 is only 6.4 inches long with a weight of 1.4 pounds and a seven round capacity magazine. This little 32 ACP cartridge has probably been the most shown in the series and it will remain that way because so many of these pocket pistols chambered it. I'm happy to say that when we talk about the inventor of this pistol, I get to bring up just one of those names that you don't hear in the popular firearms history, but is everywhere in the written history. That name is John Warnon. Now, John was, um, he was really influential in revolver technology. As a matter of fact, he invented the rebounding hammer. That's super important. Now, he's sort of linked to the Adobe system. We see his name pop up. It's not really clear in the muddy waters of who did what, especially out of Liège. What all he's actually responsible for purely on his own, but he had a big, big influence in what we'll see as military revolvers right up until that period just before World War I. Now, by 1905, he had left all that behind and was working on a series of pistols. These mostly centered on the idea of a tipping or unlocking barrel. Sometimes in these patents, you'll see the barrel tip forward. Sometimes you'll see the whole action tip back. Sometimes you'll see the whole action just sort of release entirely for disassembly. But through this series of patents, he set, him up, so he set himself up quite nicely because these would be bought by Nicholas Piper. Now, Nicholas Piper is the son of the famous Henry Piper and ran his company after his death kind of straight into the ground. Sorry, Nicholas. Uh, he over-diversified and faced bankruptcy, so he had to give up his ownership of Piper, which, by the way, managed to survive sort of hobbling without him. He went on to found his own Piper company a little later with the help of a brother-in-law, and he bought the Warnant Patents. So he released a pair of pistols known as the Demontante and the Basculant. Meanwhile, over at, oh, more German words. Okay, let's try this. Osterreichische Waffenfabrik Gesellschaft. You guys can leave it in the comments how bad that was. All those fancy words ended up getting ditched for its location, Steyr. So Steyr is looking for a pocket pistol. Remember, Johnny B started a revolution and everybody wants in. Well, Nicholas Piper has a design. You see, Steyr can't scale down their current production pistol, the Roth Steyr, enough, so they gotta look outside. And they find the Demontant to be a pretty good idea. Although, when they go to acquire the patents in 1908, they're seeing some good features that they're gonna carry over. Let's get into those differences. If we look, here's our tipping barrel Steyr made pistol. Uh, the lever on the left side, and it's kinda hard for me to do this in show, lever on the left side, Spring assist flip open. Very easy. But let's rewind just a little bit. Here is one of the Belgian designs. All right, this is a lot earlier. Now this guy, most of these Piper made Belgian designs, when we flip that lever, we're not gonna get a tipping action. What we're going to get is a simplified takedown. Boom, we're in, we can clean. For some reason, Piper just didn't like the tipping barrel, even though it is in the original patents. He liked this cleaning method. And so most of the Belgians are gonna look like this in various shapes and sizes and calibers. All right, let's get that out of the way and get over to our feature today. All right, so if we're looking at this, we have a tip open barrel. The other interesting thing is that there is no uh, extraction system. It's kind of hard to see, but we'll show it better in the animation, but there is no extractor. Um, instead, we have these sort of grooves to help with gas escape and being a true blowback system, not only is the uh, breech operated by that, but the casing itself is ejected just through blowback operation as well. This ends up being sort of the worst feature of this pistol because, well, you know, if you don't have perfect detonation, you're gonna have to tip this thing open 
and you're going to have to pry it out with a fingernail or something else. It doesn't help to have less than pristine ammo with this gun. All right, while we have the tip up open, I should probably point out that the lower section is the barrel and the upper section is the recoil spring and you'll notice that it's currently disconnected from the action. Well, the slide, therefore, is independent and there's no spring pressure on it at the moment. This can be a pain if it gets juked to the rear because now when we go to close her, she's not gonna lock up. But if she's too far forward, that's not so much a problem. This shaped lug puts her right where she needs to be and she will click down. Now, if you notice, we've got a tab that locks in. So when that's locked in, I can pull the slide to the rear and you see that piston, it's gonna suck her right forward. That's how she links, is that little anchor right there. As a matter of fact, if I tip her forward, I can even get my fingers on there and give it a good pry and she's gonna come, it's just not so easy. Kind of ingenious, I like it, it lets you separate the action and yet it comes back together well as long as the slide doesn't get pushed to the rear. Other Steyr improvements include uh, making a steeper rake, putting two screws in there, stuff like that, minor stuff. Um, the biggest thing left to talk about is probably this odd magazine down here. Uh, let's see, if I get her out, now unloaded this is easy, it pops right out, but with the sort of cartridges in there, it swells a bit. She can be a little stiff. Uh, it's unusual in that, first of all, for a heel release, we're pushing on the rear and we have our tab at the rear. It makes it a little ungainly. The other thing is, it has two notches, two positions. That first one is sort of for quote unquote target mode. Uh, here, let's get her in there. Click one, okay, so we're, we're set up like that. Now, uh, the semi-automatic action is working but it can't pick up the next round. So that means that we can tip the barrel forward, put it around, close her, fire one. She's going to eject, but she's not gonna pick up another round. So we tip the barrel again, load, fire two. Then the idea is just single shot, it's just a single shot pistol. Um, if we click her all the way in, we now have multi-shot regular semi-automatic pistol. This is of dubious merit because quite frankly, I just don't find it all that useful to have a single shot pistol for target shooting on the side. And it ends up confusing the issue when you're trying to load the magazine or unload in a hurry because nine times out of 10 when we were on the range and we still had rounds in here and we were pulling it out, we'd pull that second position, it would get stuck, and then we'd have to hit her again. And it's dropping free now, but with a cartridge in there, we'd have to hit it again and somehow get another finger or something in that little narrow gap and pull her all the way out. Bit of a pain in the butt. All right, other than that though, fairly good pistol. Um, the last improvement I think Steyr did was just cleaning up the sights. We can do a quick picture of that. Great. All right, why don't we go ahead and do our little x-ray trick to get into just how this thing works on the inside though. Okay, let's load this to the first notch. Note that the magazine is now not deep enough to feed the next round. We'll press the left side lever to release the barrel to spring upward and load one round in the chamber and close. See? Single shot. Now we'll shove the magazine all the way in and tip our barrel down and reload our chamber. Note how our overhead rod hooks on the breech block. Now we're rocking and rolling. Returning to basics, this is a single action hammer fired pistol. The safety is another simple one, it just turns and blocks the path of the hammer. The disconnect is tipped by the hammer plunger, instead of the slide like we've seen so often with other designs. You'll see an indicator pin at the rear of the pistol. This guy is pressing up against that hammer and will tell us whether or not it's cocked. All right, we'll clear this magazine and hand it over to May. We'll load to the first notch. Tip the barrel and load the chamber. Squeeze. That was single shot. 
Let's push that mag in and rack the slide. The safety should be pretty familiar compared to other 32s. However, that recoil pushed my grouping fairly wide. You know, I'd really like to thank May for her uh, patience on that one. We edited it to look nice and clean, but to be honest with you, we consumed two firing pins in this process. This gun is sort of self-destructive in just how severe its recoil can be due to its light slide. Now, the uh, Steyr would mostly serve as a civilian pistol, and it was produced in sort of a big lump batch from 1909 until 1911, when Steyr sort of decided to move on to another idea, the Steyr Han military pistol. This was a much bigger, more lucrative contract, and we'll get to it a little bit later. Now that doesn't mean that Steyr gave up on this 1909, it just means that they built up some inventory so that they could focus on something else. They planned to sell through it slowly, you know, on the side to the commercial market. They just wanted that military contract. Now, the 1909 sat in inventory until, well, the Frommer stop sort of got in the way. We're gonna cover this pistol another time, but it's a hot little 32, and most importantly for now, it's Hungarian. In the dual monarchy, everything was separate but equal. Well, a little more equal for the Austrians. And so the idea of this little Hungarian pistol being around, it ruffles some feathers, and they wanted an Austrian design in 32 to kind of compete with it. So Steyr offered up the 1909 as a pocket military pistol. And Austria took it. They called it the Model 13, and they went ahead and added a lanyard loop under the left grip, and that was really about it. It really just required milling out some of the plastic and setting a screw through there. Uh, they didn't even bother producing new for the military. They just took 8,000 from inventory. Another 2,025 ACPs were also released to the military. These are a really small number for really far off the line officers. We're not gonna get a lot into that. So with a combined total of 10,000 Steyr Pipers in the military, it probably wasn't the most impactful of World War I, but it's pretty unique and we felt like it was worth mentioning. That's not the end of production though. Um, these would prove to be popular enough that after the war, production resumed in 1919 through 1929 for the 32s and all the way to 1932 for the 25s. Those were some confusing numbers. 1929 for the 32s, 1932 for the 25s. Sorry. All right, so uh, that's still not the end though because the 32s are still in police and military use and they're becoming a problem. So you see, we mentioned that light slide, the horrible recoil, parts started fatiguing and cracking. You have feed problems because of the lack of an extractor. In 1934, refurbishment comes out. So they start replacing uh, this rear section with a heavier slide, an extractor, and a, even a rubber recoil buffer. So this is the 0934 model. These would serve Austria into the Anschluss and then on into the Reich. So they are going to be present for World War II. After that, they mostly end up being able to retire in peace. So let's go ahead and get May's opinion on the original 1909 and 32 as it would have been used in the First World War. The May came back the very next day. The May came back. We thought she was a goner, but the May came back. And she's going to talk about the Steyr Piper 1909. All right, so how did you feel just handling this pistol right off the bat? You know, right off the bat, I noticed this was a very comfortable gun. I thought the weight was ev evenly distributed. I thought it was a nice slim gun, that it was going to be very comfortable. And then it starts to get a little bit hinky. I found the safety itself was difficult to operate one-handed on, yet easy to operate one-handed off. The magazine, I thought had a lot of potential, even though it was a heel release because of this push button. But on 
on the actual feel, we noticed it kept snagging at that first actual bar right there. So we'd have to try to pull it out manually one-handed. Um, the slide is actually easier to maneuver. It's pretty light. What I found was the easiest actually, weirdly enough, was the tip open barrel release. That just easy as butter. Okay, well with high remarks like that, I'm sure you're about to tell us that this was your favorite shooter of the entire series to date. No, 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 no. No, but really seriously, this was, this was a mediocre shooter. The trigger itself I found was, eh, it was all right. It's not like it was remarkable. There was nothing good or nothing bad about it. It was even, there was just nothing exciting about it, I guess. The swoop back grip here, I thought was nice and comfortable to grab. But then we get into actually shooting it, and I found the recoil on this gun was unmanageable. And it's most likely for just two reasons. One, the breech block back here was really light, and then I don't know why they did this, but the spring in here is light too. I mean, I can operate the slide without the spring, so they could have made the spring heavy to help with the recoil, but they just they decided not to, and I don't know why. And as for the sights on this gun, they're pretty small. They weren't really that clear to read, so when it came down for the recoil, I had a hard time realigning my shots. It just this was not a this was not one of my favorite shooters. Yeah, unfortunately, this pistol just doesn't deliver how you think it should. You pick it up and it feels great right off the bat. Uh, except for my big old thumb gets in the way of that uh, lever sometimes when I try to thumb high. I gotta kind of consciously thumb low. And the magazine's a little squirrely. But, hey, 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 we've seen worse. This is gonna be great. And then the recoil kicks in. And those follow-up shots are terrible. I mean, you are just thrown all around the paper. They did, however, address this, like we said, with the 34 update, where you get a heavier breech block, a buffer, and an extractor. That extractor will become important in a moment. Yeah, I would have actually liked to have shot the 34. I mean, the fact that it had the extractor, a heavier breech block, and the sights were better, that's the potential that this gun has to be great. I would love to shoot that. It looks like we're gonna have to ask one of you guys to loan us one and see if we can get another opinion updated. That we can do later. Uh, while we're talking about it, I should probably mention, if you don't mind, we had several problems with this pistol all around the firing pin. Now, that doesn't mean that the firing pin was an inherent problem in the design, but because we had two, two broken firing pins, we had two separate occasions in which we would have a fail to fire. At the time, we didn't know that it was from the firing pin each time. Believe me, we were incredulous the second time. But uh, here's what goes. So you pull the trigger, you get a click, and you get no bang. Well, all of us with any sort of modern training whatsoever, we're going to drop the mag, and we're going to rack the slide. Well, you run into a couple of problems here. Uh, first of all, there's an instinct when you're working with this old stuff, instead of right away dropping the mag, is to go ahead and give the slide a little inspection. If you do that, it's not going to extract. And if you really aren't paying attention, you're going to double feed because there's no extractor. The gas system has to extract, so you've still got a live round. That's a little problematic. Now, if you remember to drop your mag, when it's got some rounds in it, it really starts to stick. So as you hit that lever, it tends to want to fall right on that first notch where it then relocks. Now you have an air gap between your thumb and the lever. I know you guys can't see that too well, but trust me, there's an air gap there. And now you can't quite roll your thumb onto the lever and drag the magazine open. So you have to get your other hand involved. And when you get your other hand involved, your thumb is naturally in the way. It's this whole juggling act with a live round in the chamber potentially, if you've forgotten that you have the tip open barrel available, which you always do because it's the only tip open barrel you work with. So you get the mag out, all right? Then you go to work the slide, nothing's happening. Oh yeah, tip open barrel. We pop that guy open and now we've got to pry this thing out with a fingernail or a pocket knife if it's stuck whatsoever. If it's nice and clean, thankfully we can tip her out, but you know, who's thinking that far ahead? All right, so obviously in non-ideal conditions, in a jam, this just isn't the pistol you want to work with, which is why that 34 extractor is so important. Extractors are important. Okay, so we've gotten the negatives aside. Let's get your opinion. You are an Austro-Hungarian officer and you are handed this pistol and told, good luck, how do you feel? You know, I'm feeling terrified. This gun had so many problems on the range. I mean, he mentioned two broken firing pins, the magazine was difficult to pull out. 
the recoil was unmanageable, the sights were awful to realign. I would be terrified to take this into battle. I would not take this in battle at all. Okay, well with that resounding review, I think we've wrapped this pistol up. But no, seriously, we, we love this gun conceptually. If you have one in your collection, you should be very proud. They're extremely unique, and they're a lot of fun to shoot eh, with a little whip on the wrist uh, at the range. It's just that as a military pistol, it does not work. And there's a lot of potential there. We, we know that tip-up barrels can be great for people with weak hands. We know all the possibilities. They're just not well executed yet. It's very early days. All right, so with that wrapped up and out of the way, we just want to say thank you all for watching, and don't forget that we've got some updates after the credits. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Sorry for the low quality. I do not have a helper today. We're sort of scrambling for Christmas time. But that's all right, I'm recording good audio. Uh, let's see, a couple things to cover. The Indiegogo poster campaign wrapped up at $8,759. Um, after PayPal fees, Indiegogo fees, that sort of thing, uh, we then had to pay our printer, who also took a reduced margin. So for those of you who have received or are about to receive your posters, I hope that you notice they are excellent quality for the price um, that left us with about 3.5 left over uh, we already blew one of that right away on a great piece of equipment we hope you'll enjoy we've also gone ahead and spent five hundred dollars on some additional reading material so that we can get ahead on this machine gun research um, the other thing is we've got some equipment that sort of started falling apart here microphones and things like that so it's great this is well timed we'll be able to replace things and keep the show rolling and make some more positive investments we just got to plan out exactly where we want to put it uh, Patreon is up to 870. That is up, not down. If you've been following the numbers, it sounds like down, but Patreon has changed how they report the numbers. That is a much closer number to what will actually enter our hands at the beginning of each month. Uh, I also need to thank uh, Paul Evans for loaning us this piece as well as several others. Um, Paul, your last pistol is up in the next two weeks. So somewhere in the next five days or so, I'll be able to get your collection back to you. I know you've been missing it for quite some time and thanks for being patient while we got used to this format. Um, for those of you who might wanna loan us something, uh, we take very good care. Uh, we're very honest with our handling and uh, just let us know what you have. Um, I've actually had some people make some offers and I wanna make sure I say one thing very clearly. If you email us something that you can loan, we may not be able to use it right away, especially if it's not World War I. But what I will do is I will respond whether or not we already have it. And if we don't already have it, I'm literally going to take your email with your list and put it in a separate folder in my Gmail so that I can search it as we get further into the show. So if I say to myself, oh, now that we're out of World War I, I want to cover Spanish Mausers, then I'll be able to just plug in Spanish Mauser and see that you're on our list of willing donors and give you contact at that point. And I'm sorry that I don't have a better way of handling that that's more personal, but at least, you know, even if it's not something that fits right now, if you want to put the offer out there, we can contact you about it later when we do have the time. And we very, very, very much appreciate it. Um, just because we can't use it doesn't mean that the thought behind it wasn't wonderful. And we really appreciate people sharing their pieces of history, not only with us, but with the rest of the world. Okay, so on top of that, uh, if anybody's got a Lee Enfield uh, number one Mark III with the volley sights, please let me know. We've been looking to borrow one for a while. Uh, on top of that, let's see. Oh, the, the channel itself, last thing I gotta say. Uh, you guys are watching more of the show, especially because of the Ross Rifle episode. I'm glad to see that it was well-loved. And we will try for longer formats when we can, and I will try to soak more details out. I've been sort of holding back to make it more viewer-friendly, but it seems like you guys really want detail and nuance when it's available. So we'll do that for you. Uh, <clears throat> now, our subscriber count, though, hasn't really gone up very much in the past month. And it just seems like we've sort of, we don't know where to share ourselves at this point. So if you know of a forum or a blog that might want to hear from us, just let me know. I, I'm more than welcome to talk to anybody. And by the way, I don't want to be like shoved down somebody's throat. I just, if somebody would appreciate the show, we'll show them the show. 
All right, that's it. Thank you all for watching and uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.